Welcome to the Women Leaders Association Daily Member Podcast, where we believe we go further, faster, and have more fun when we go together. I'm your host, Julianne Kirkland. And in each Daily Member Podcast, we will pick out a great speaker from one of our meetings that we thought you would enjoy. You can access hundreds of recent speakers, book summaries, great articles, and more at no additional charge through your membership portal. If you would like to get involved in a Women Leaders Association Mastermind Group or find a networking group near you, or if you just need access to the membership portal, simply go to womenleaderspodcast.com to be connected. Now let's tune in for this incredible message. Uh, Yeah, sure. So hi there. Thanks for having me. My name is Eva Simpson. I am the Vice President of Tax Practice and Financial Planning for the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants where I currently oversee our tax and financial planning disciplines and the development of technical resources, tools, and training to support accountants and financial professionals who provide these services. Um, The Association of International Certified Professional Accountants, which uh, you might hear me refer to as the association later on in the presentation, um, is the most influential body of professional accountants representing 689,000 members, students, and professionals in public and management accounting in 180 countries and advocates for the public interest and business sustainability on current and emerging issues. Um, Happy to be here today. My name is Georgiana Thomas, and I am a human resource manager with Alliance Health, which is based out of the RTP, which in Morrisville is our home office. We have um, several other offices um, in the Charlotte area, as well as in the Cumberland area. And um, we are a managed care organization which um, serves the, some of the most vulnerable people in society um, with m- mental health um, concerns as well as substance abuse. Um, I serve as an HR manager and, and my focus is um, I'm managing the employee relations team at Alliance Health. Um, in that role, um, I do employee relations and supervisor training. Um, I'm also, also responsible for policies and procedures, EEO investigations, mediations, And um, I'm the chair of the Employee Engagement um, Initiative at Alliance, and I'm happy to be here. We're glad you're here also. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Sue Mathias, and I work at Duke in the Pratt School of Engineering. And I lead a team there uh, that works with our graduate students, our graduate engineering students, to support their communication needs. We have about 2,000 master's and PhD students that we work with. And just for context today, um, I want to share that our team is a part of a broader student support department. So a lot of my responses today in the conversation will be based in that kind of nested um, arrangement that we have there. Happy to. So happy to be here with you this afternoon. Um, I am the Director of Strategic Communications at Lidos, which is a Fortune 500 technology company providing a wide range of services to customers, mostly in the federal space, but also international governments as well. Um, In my role, I lead our strategic communications for one of our largest business units, a um, $7.7 billion contract with the Department of the Navy, where we provide end-to-end IT services. Um, However, I'm also a former journalist. I spent 15 years of my career doing as a reporter and as a newspaper editor with my last stop actually being here in Raleigh at the Museum Observer. That's a very good question. We've had, um, like many other organizations, we've we've had to adjust and kind of recreate ourselves once COVID hit. And so we have tried to leverage different options that include um, location, Um, work location as well as work hours and work days. So um, my organization has a hybrid situation where um, a lot or I would say most of our employees are working remotely. They also do have the opportunity to come into the office if if they need to or if they just want to get away. So we have we still have workplaces for um, workspaces that we share and flex spaces that our employees can work in on site. My organization also has mobile working because we have um, a significant portion of our employees are community facing. So um, they're out in the community. And so we have something that's called mobile working. So um, you're out in the community and, you know, you have another appointment and you can stop in Starbucks or somewhere, you know, with 
with the security place with measures and parameters that we've put in place and, and you can just work there as well. Um, we use a communication platform in Microsoft Teams and so that that is help facilitate and help help us get comfortable in um, offering those types of hybrid environments for our employees to work. And I think that it's it's been, it's gone very well. It's gone very well so far. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have access to a number of tools like Georgiana. Uh, we, we utilize Microsoft Teams quite extensively. Um, as far as staying connected, uh, the way that I like to engage with my teams is that we have weekly huddles to make sure that we're all continuing to stay on the same page and the team member running that huddle rotates each week. So it gives accountability for those who participate and on these huddles, we do require cameras to be on to ensure that one, they're paying attention. Um, but we, we wanna make sure that there are there is that level, that appropriate level of engagement and minimize um, distractions. We're also able to use Teams for some of the quick water cooler type chats that are no longer possible um, in a road environment. Uh, but what you can do there is you can set up a team chat that you can kind of pop something in there and try to request immediate feedback from others and they can all pop in and provide their point of view on that. And we use that for quick pop up uh, pop up questions to prevent our inbox questions from getting any more overwhelming than they already are. Um, and then Teams is also a good tool because it provides the capability to save and share files, set up different groups. It has an interactive whiteboard function so you can actually conduct activities. Um, to engage your teams. It's a very useful tool for engagement we found in the, in the virtual environment. Yeah, um, so important. Such a great question and topic. Um, I think that regular frequent check-ins are so important, one-on-one uh, -on -one and as a part of the team. And so our team meets at least every other week as a group and we start every meeting with a check-in question. And that check-in question comes from rotating team members. And it's it's really meant to be very informal, a very uh, casual way to just uh, arrive um, <laughs> physically, mentally, emotionally at, at the meeting. And I think it really creates uh, a space for all of us to share where we are and how we're feeling. So I think... Um, you know, we, we need to kind of make that space, make that opportunity to build that community and to remind each other that we're there for each other, not just to, to get the work done, but to really support one another. Um, in addition to that, I have biweekly one-on-ones with each person on my team. So that, again, is an opportunity for them to share when things are, you know, maybe not going so well. Um, sometimes we take those online, sometimes in person. If we are in person together, I love to get out and do like a walk and talk. Or sometimes we just do a walk and talk remotely from our phones. Um, so I think creating different ways, different opportunities to um, deformalize some of our communication and some of our, our coming together uh, really allows people to to be empathetic and reminds us all that, you know, we're humans. I think that's absolutely what um, Sue shared is absolutely the right approach. I, in my own team, the particular interesting thing about the business unit I work for at Lidos, we're a team, a unit of 4,000 people, nearly two thirds of us are full-time teleworkers. So we're never in the same place. All of the folks I work with on my team directly in communications, they're spread all over the world. Um, so really making sure doing, you're doing those check-ins with your people one-on-one, -on -one, um, making space. This was a growth, a growth moment for me, making space at the beginning of my team meetings for small talk. How's it going? So that you can continue to build that rapport and make space for people to feel like it's not just business, that they have a chance to get to know each other, to kind of share those ideas. But even more than that, I think it's, that own personal regulation that we have to do. Um, knowing when, yeah, you could send an email, you could ping someone through Teams or through Slack, but sometimes we need to pick up the phone and check in with folks. So you can hear those tones, hear that voice. I will often get emails from some of my junior staff on my team where it feels like they're overwhelmed. So rather than assuming, I'm gonna pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, how's this project going? 
what, what, what are the challenges? How are you feeling about things? So I think it just takes more of those things that we already know to do, but being more intentional about them and making sure that we're building them in and not leaving it to chance so that we're really making sure that we're taking the time to, like I said, tune into people and how they're doing. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, we, I'm currently based in the, out of our Durham location, and we do have office space available there still for anyone who prefers to work out of the office. At the same time, we do offer flexibility to allow our team members to work remotely, which many of them do prefer. Do prefer. And we even have teams in other locations, like I have team members in Tennessee and in D.C. at the coast. Um, so it, it really is preference. Um, that being said, we do, we do like to provide that flexibility, but with the flexibility comes obligation and obligation, which is tough. And I think every, what everyone's trying to balance in a remote working environment is the ob obligation that work is getting done. Um, and so we're able to monitor that through the frequent check-ins and our huddles and, and just updates that we have with that frequent engagement with our teams, which is why communication um, is so important. Uh, while we do have the flexibility to work from home or go into the office, we also have an understanding with our team members that there will be occasions that require everyone to go into the office. Like there might be certain meetings they need to attend in person or leadership might be in town and we want them to be you know, on site to engage given the opportunity to do that. And um, we have found that this flexible approach to office versus remote can be effective, again, as long as the desired outcomes of everyone's roles are being achieved. Um, I would say it's not formalized, but we, yes, we do really talk about expectations and often try to set those as a group as well. So, you know, it's not one person dictating expectations, but coming from the group, uh, in general, cameras should be on. Um, you know, there are going to be circumstances where that can't happen, but whenever possible, we want cameras to be on. Um, we want to make space for everyone to be heard, to share. Some people are chattier than others. So trying to make sure that you've heard from your teammates. Um, and I share an agenda. I try to draft an agenda and share it in box with the whole team ahead of time so that they know what's coming, but also they can add to it. So, you know, kind of, again, sharing that responsibility of being present and coming together and everyone has a vested interest. It's not one person driving a process. Yes, that's that's very important. And I think that um, we have strived to do that at my organization by flexible scheduling um, and and facilitating and encouraging wellness activities. Um, for example, we encourage our employees to, to squeeze in a wellness activity. We, as an organization, have been committed to doing that and to offering 45 minutes of wellness activities with supervisor approval every week. And so we sponsor yoga and mindfulness and things of that nature. And so employees are able and able to, and they're encouraged to participate in that. Um, I think there are ways that we we, we have to structure our, our lives based on where, where we are now. And um, some of the things that I have encouraged our employees to do is um, the ones that are working from home remotely to make sure that you carve out some true space for work so that you, you get to have a cutoff time. So you're, you're working from home, but don't work in the bedroom and stay in the bedroom all day and then all night too. And it, it gets a little suffocating. Um, other things that I have recommended is um, to establish a distinctive work time, a distinctive start time and a distinctive end time. I know I can speak for myself that it, it became quite fluid when, when this all first started. And I was working um, 10, 12, 14 hours without even noticing it because I was, I was home. And um, another piece of that also is to kind of carve out some time for lunch, um, carve out some time to do the things that you enjoy um, make plans for after work so that, you know, you, you have that in place and you have something to look forward to when you close that laptop and walk away. Um, I've also encouraged folks to kind of take a walk sometimes, you know, if, if it's beautiful outside, you know, take a break, um, take a break and just 
walk around the house or walk around the building, walk to the mailbox, if, if you know, whatever you have time for, to just walk away and give yourself some work-life balance. I have myself practiced also specifically putting in a break on my calendar, on, on my outlook. And it, it may move a couple of times, but it, I have a break on there every day. And so if we take those steps and at least try to be intentional about keeping that, that work-life balance, I think that that is very beneficial for all of us. Oh, that's wonderful. I do think it makes a huge difference in when we're no longer place bound, finding talent in places that you didn't expect. Um, except the business unit, I support is 4,000 people who products and provide services to the federal IT services, the federal government, the chasing after the talent pool in the DC area where my company is located is hard because everyone is looking for that cybersecurity specialist, looking for that talent because we're not place bound for our work, we've been able to tap into places where we found groups that we normally wouldn't have thought about. Um, we've been able to have a more diverse labor force because we aren't just looking in the DC national capital region and that we've been able to tap into that. And so I think that's a benefit that we are able to think differently about our talent, who we need and to open that aperture a bit. Um, the other upside is, is that I think we, to Leanne's conversation in the last session, people are able to be more authentic and be themselves at work. They're no longer worrying about how do I leave my office in time to do a child pickup? How do I figure out how to manage the demands of our lives? And so I think the flexibility matters um, a great deal for our employees. And I think that's definitely one of the benefits. However, the downside of it is, is that we have to be more intentional about how we engage with our staffs. Um, when you're all in the same office together, it's easy to run by somebody's office and poke a head in and find out about a project. Um, it's easy to see when someone on your team is feeling a little disconnected because you'll see those visual and body cues about how they're feeling. So that's a downside, but I think it's absolutely something that we can mitigate it goes back to that earlier question. Are we checking in? Are we being more intentional about our connections? Are we doing things like happy, you know, virtual happy hours for our remote staff? So we're finding time to talk to them and to connect with them. Are we doing one-on-ones? Are we religious about those one-on-ones? Because I think when you're in an office, it's easy to skip one because you're going to see them the next day and they're in the same office. And so I just think while there are definitely downsides for those kind of interpersonal connections, I think all of that can be mitigated in a, in a hybrid workspace that we just, but it requires as managers and as you know individual contributors to be intentional about that. And I, that's the advice I give to my team. I tell them, if you need more from me than what I'm giving you right now, you have to tell me. If that means you need a twice a week check-in instead of every other week, I need to know that. Um, if I'm scheduling meetings at 8 a.m. and forgetting that you are in Seattle and you would not like to get up at five o'clock in the morning, call me out. <laughs> you know, so I think it requires all of us to be honest and open about what we need in these spaces to mitigate those downsides. Sure, sure. So first of all, I agree with Holly. As she made some really good points. Um, the talent pool does grow under a remote um, working model. And for example, for from where I'm sitting prior to we were remote prior to when we started remotely working, all of my colleagues were primarily in one location here in Durham, North Carolina. And since moving to the remote model, um, we've been able to acquire talent all over the country and for many other divisions in my organization globally too. And really by not being limited to a particular market, the quality of our talent has always improved because we can now really fine tune what we're looking for when we have access to a broader population of talent. Um, in addition to that, I do think flexibility is another benefit with remote work. There's there's less time spent commuting back and forth to the office, which can, for some, add hours back to your day. This can offer more time with your family, time to get a workout in, and, or many other things that were pre, uh, previously challenging to squeeze in on a work day. From the perspective of downsides, I'd say the biggest downside I've seen is that it does take a toll on camaraderie. Uh, though we engage frequently online, some things just aren't the same as in-person engagement, especially when you have talent that lives in other locations. 
And that's really why engagement online, being present and minimizing distractions can be so important. Um, and then just touching on what Georgiana said, for some, there is that inability to disconnect when you work remotely. And if you think about it, you know, when you go to the office, you have to physically shut down and get in the car and go home. Remotely, it's harder to do that. It's easy to get stuck in the habit of I'm just going to do one more thing or let me just knock this off my list really quickly. Uh, so there is some discipline that's required when you work remotely, and that should be communicated at all levels, um, upwards and down. Um, despite this, I do still believe that the pros outweigh the cons. Yeah, well, I'm going to go back to something Georgiana said earlier, and I think part of it is uh, wellness related. I think caring about the wellness of your team and making sure they value it too, well, not not enforcing values, but you know, making sure they know you value it and you care about them is really important. So um, we often will do something I mentioned before, like a walk and talk, or um, I mentioned that I'm part of a, a broader student support department, and sometimes the entire department will get together for something like Koru mindfulness session or nutrition counselors. We bring in various resources across Duke to talk to us about wellness-based things. So we had a nutrition counselor in um, about a week ago. Uh, we've had folks come in and talk about accessibility. So really getting to a place where you say, you know, we care about you holistically. We care about you as a person and we value you as a person. And I think that really inspires people and helps people, going back to that empathy idea, helps people think about the people we're serving, you know, that our students also are whole people and they have these same needs. And so um, showing up for them and showing up for each other, showing up for ourselves with, with that in mind. Um, we try to do some fun things too. You know, we try to occasionally have an outing where we'll uh, do an escape room or have a, a lunch off site or a gathering off site. Uh, even if we're having a team meeting, maybe we just say, okay, this month, let's have our team meeting at a, at a restaurant or something. Um, so something that's kind of spontaneous and maybe unpredictable for them. And then one of the more ongoing and sustainable uh, tactics we use is through teams. We have a variety of channels that we use that are really not work <laughs> related. So we have one that's just called water cooler. And, you know, that's where folks will drop in just chit chat that you might make around a, a water cooler, but this one's virtual. Um, we have another channel called Friday Favorites, so people can put in recommendations. Maybe it's a something, a show or a movie they just saw, or they bought something that they think is amazing and they want to shout it out to everyone. And we also have a shout outs channel to for all of us to shout out other team members when we think someone went above and beyond, or we just want to make sure the rest of the team knows um, about something important someone did. So I think all of those online opportunities uh, build that com camaraderie that, that Ava mentioned too. Sure. And, and I agree with Sue. Um, it's very important to show employees that you value them and to, to show empathy. And I think that it's true across um, both levels on the individual um, leader or management level, as well as organization-wide. Um, my, my organization is um, tries to motivate through, as I said earlier, the wellness activities that are encouraged and offered. Um, we also have virtual activities. Um, we, we have organization-wide um, celebrations. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, tomorrow is National Employee Appreciation Day. And so with the way that we honor those, those milestones and celebrations is respecting that some people are virtual and some people will want to come on site. So we're very intentional about making those activities both um, virtual as well as on site, um, things like um, painting and clay making or yoga or things like that. Um, we also have a bi-weekly show, um, a team's show where we have guest speakers um, and we highlight different departments or different employees. And we do that also with our, our business meetings and not with just also the fun stuff. 
um, as on the team or the, the management level, I think we can motivate our employees by just you know, communication. Communication is very important in staying connected. So um, I know that that my leader um, will send an encouraging message every now and then. On occasions, you may get a good morning, and so the whole team is responding back. Or if it's just a beautiful day outside, and she would encourage you, look, it's it's 70 degrees. Everybody take a breath. Go outside. Open the window. Go get lunch. Or, you know, every now and then we get the surprise of a couple hours of early release so that, you know, you get that time back and you can do that some do something for yourself. So I think those those are very important ways of um, encouraging and showing that you value your employees. We do. Uh, I would say my short answer is it depends <laughs> how I handle them. I'd love to do them in person, so that's that's my preference. But um, you know, we have biweekly one-on-one chats throughout the year ongoing. And so if I can't get together with that person in person for a more formal um, annual or semi-annual review, it's okay. I, you know, I'm going to catch up with that person at some point in person and we'll have a chance to talk about anything that maybe didn't get fully fleshed out online. So yeah, I, I prefer one-on-one -on -one in person, but we can do remote. Okay. Yeah. So I have, I have team members located all over um, so all of our one-on-ones and on, reviews are handled virtually. Uh, we have a performance management platform that we utilize to document goal setting and monitor performance throughout the year, as well as year end. We have frequent check-ins, so there's no surprises. There's that, you know, on-time feedback. Um, so that in combination with the tools that we have, like Teams, where we use the camera so you can read um, engagement, you can read, you know, reactions so you can see their visual cues. Having access to those tools in the, in the performance management system, the one-on-ones um, and reviews can, I think, can be handled just as just as effectively uh, remotely as they can be in person. So yeah, I, think, I think that works when you have on. If you're able to provide on-time feedback, that helps the performance management process as well. Because if you do, if you're doing that and doing it well, then there really won't be any surprises once you get to that performance management piece. Exactly. So let's see, Holly, we'll follow up with you on the same question. Can you talk about was, one -on ones? Yeah, I was just going to echo what Eva just said, that what I found, because I said my team is in Virginia Beach and Seattle and Dallas. I have a person in Okinawa. Um, so I don't often have the luxury of doing them in person. But to Eva's earlier point, as a manager and as a leader, it's made me more intentional that I am giving feedback real time. So if there is a performance issue, I'm addressing it when it happens and talking about it then and figuring out how ways to help remediate or mitigate the issue so that there's not so much weight on the performance review itself. So it doesn't become so fraught because I know that I can't be with them in person and deliver it because I've been able to give that, I've made a point of giving that feedback throughout the year. And so by the time we get to a performance review, it's really mostly for my team, it's mostly about compensation. They want to know what the bonus was. They want to know what the raise was. <laughs> and because we've given that, because I've made a point of really working hard that I am addressing any issues, giving praise, giving correction, whatever it is throughout the year. So not all of the weight is on the performance review to deal with everything. And I think that's a good working practice, whether you're remote and your people are all over the world or you're sitting next to them every single day as a leader. We have to get in the process of, like I said, giving the praise when it's deserved and giving it in real time and then also giving the correction in real time when it's needed so that it just doesn't become so fraught. Yes, I think one-on-ones are so very important um, and it's so very important to make the most of them, not only for the, like the performance management discussions and the corrective actions or the corrections, but also to just stay connected and to know what everybody, you know, that we're all on the same page. What's working for you? What's not working for you? What can I help you with? What do you need? What do you, do you what barriers do you have? And so I think that they can be effective even if they're not in person because we have so much technology. Um, 
Now, we use Teams. Um, we had Zoom before that. We had Skype before that. Um, there's all kinds of, you know, there's the cell phone. You can call and, and talk to someone and hear their voice. And um, just like many of the other ways of connecting with employees that um, everyone else has mentioned, the um, meeting, having a lunch, getting together. Um, just we, I know my team has had a chat and chew because we're a little spread out. So we get on teams at lunchtime, you bring your lunch, turn on your camera and we're gonna chat and chew. And it may not be business related and it's certainly not performance of discussions. We're just kind of chatting and chewing as if we were together in person. And um, I really like the idea that that Sue mentioned the, the walk and talk. I, I actually wrote that down. So I'm probably gonna implement that very soon. Um. I, th I think my final thoughts are just keep working to stay connected to people, reach out, when in doubt, <laughs> reach out, you know, because I think we can, it's much easier now to stay in your silo or to be insulated because you're maybe working from home or you're working in a different place from your team and you're chugging along thinking that everything's okay. Um, but it's really important to keep checking in with people um, personally and professionally. So, yeah. Um, just a little bit of background. In the 16 years I've been doing corporate communications and marketing, more than half of that, I've been a teleworker full-time, disconnected from my team. I've been in North Carolina or I've been in DC and that my team wasn't with me. The thing that I think that makes this kind of new workplace in a post-pandemic world work is a high degree of self-awareness. I am naturally introverted by heart. And if I don't walk, catch it, catch it, I will not go out of my house for two days straight because I just go to work and then I leave yeah. and I don't leave. And so I think it's really important for all of us, no matter what level we are in our organization, is to be self-aware, to know what your limits are, what your predispositions are. To Georgiana's earlier point, I have to make plans after work to make sure I leave my house because otherwise it'll be 24 hours and I haven't left my house. Um, and so really being aware of what you need to be successful is, I think, a big part of it. And then, like I said, not being afraid to talk to your teammates, to your managers, to your peers about what you need. I need more time with you. Can you turn on your camera? I'd like to see you. Those sorts of things. So I think the self-awareness is a is a big part of it. So I would say personally, I have to make sure that I don't lean too hard into my introversion and never see anybody. Um, and that I actually have to make a point to turn on that camera, get out of the house, go to an event like this to make sure I'm staying connected to other people to see his point. I I so agree with Holly um, because I I've I've had to make myself more self aware. Um, because at some point you you get where even if you are invited to something, it's like, mm, nah, I'm comfortable. <laughs> I've been here that long. So I think the self-awareness is is very important from for the individual. Um, I think the organization also, as we have to keep evolving and keeping in touch with our employees and, and knowing where they are and how they are and coming up with creative ways to engage with them and just, just keep growing growing that way. And um, one thing I think is very effective or important is that like our organization does an employee en engagement survey. So that way you can get some data and see what it is that you need as the organization and how to keep your employees engaged and how your employees are feeling about what you're doing, whether it's working or not. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for inviting me to be here today. I learned a lot, and I hope you have too. Um, but to close, I guess I'll touch on the remote piece, um, the should I, shouldn't I, do we go back to where we were before? Really, my organization moved into remote working well before the pandemic, so we were very well positioned to immediately respond and continue to support our mission as well as our staff when the environment turned upside down overnight. So it gets back to that. Think, so if you're thinking about, is this something we want to roll back? I think that this having this in place put us in a great position and is a great position for other organizations to be in. So you can be equipped to pivot when such events unexpectedly occur, especially during 
times of uncertainty like we're in right now. This is just one of those things where the sooner you prepare for it or if you maintain it, then the better. Uh, people are obviously a critical component of that equation and demonstrating how you value them, especially in this environment, does require intent and purpose. I think it's really important to know your people. Um, recognizing the telltale signs of emotional struggle, uh, which may be masked in a virtual environment, making sure you're accessible, being willing to ping someone and say, hey, do you have a sec? I found all these things to be, be very helpful. That engagement and that communication is really helpful in this environment. Um, but yeah, I said this before, but it's been my experience that the benefits that um, remote working offers to me, to my team members, and to my organization far outweigh the risks. So this is something that we look forward to maintaining into the long run for us. It's a model that works and we think it works beautifully. Um, so on that, I do want to thank everyone for your time and panel, you've been lovely. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Hey, my friend, if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, be sure to rate, review and share your biggest takeaway. And if you're wanting more, you can access hundreds of recent speakers, book summaries, great articles, and more at no additional charge through your membership portal. You can also get involved in a Women Leaders Association Mastermind group or networking group near you. Or if you just need to access your membership portal, simply go to womenleaderspodcast.com to be connected. Because here at Women Leaders Association, we believe we go further, faster, and have more fun when we go together. That's all for today, my friends. Bye for now.